How's it going, everybody? So in this episode, my patrons have chosen to bring focus to yet another mysterious animal from the Triassic period. Another of those animals that we've found that causes scientists to question everything that we thought we knew about this time in Earth's history. During this time, we know that the dinosaurs got their start and began to diversify into the ancestors of the animals that would come to rule during the Mesozoic. But the exact details of this remain shrouded in mystery for a long time. And honestly, we still don't actually have a solid understanding of it. Animals like Herrerasaurus and what we're going to talk about today kind of seem to muddy the waters in what we think an early dinosaur was really like. Normally in situations like this, our understanding will slowly get better as more material is found to help us put this puzzle together. But in the case of this thing, its discovery seems to have raised more questions than anything else. I wouldn't say it's quite as strange as animals like Adipodontatus, but the main thing that stands out about it is the fact that nobody can really come to an agreement about where exactly it fits into the Tree of Life. Because it kind of looks like an early dinosaur. But, at the same time, from what we can tell from the partial specimens that we do have, it looks like it could belong to a different branch of the archosaurs that ruled during the Triassic that we've talked about before. So this one's going to be interesting, as we get into the Paleo Catalog Basics on Smok. Really? Its name is Smok? The first remains of this enigma were discovered outside the small village of Lissowice in southern Poland in 2007, in a fossil layer dated to the very tail end of the Triassic period. These first fossils were a lower jaw and a partial skull that were believed to belong to two different individuals. One thing that was instantly clear was that this was obviously a very large and formidable predator. And when the discovery was first announced in 2008, it was given the name Smok, which translates to dragon in Polish. In fact, it is actually named directly after a dragon in Polish folklore called Smok Wawelski, that actually has a statue in Poland to this day. And after more remains were found in 2009 and 2010, it was theorized that this was an ancient ancestor to theropods, the lineage that would lead to the famous carnivorous dinosaurs as well as eventually the birds. But the closer that we started to look at this animal, the more difficult it became to put it in a solid classification. As scientists started to find more material, this animal started to show a mix of features that we find consistent with theropods, as well as some things that didn't match up at all. The other theory being that this could possibly be a lost branch of the Landcroc family tree that started to gain some more dinosaur-like features. And then, following the remains being found in 2010, there was also a set of three-toed tracks found as well. If these do belong to Smok, they would support the theory that this animal was indeed a dinosaur, since these tracks had the same three-toed foot design that all classic theropods sport, including the modern ones. But the thing is, we don't actually know if these tracks belong to Smok because the fossil remains that we found do not include any foot bones. And what's more, these tracks were found about a meter above the rock layer where Smok was found, meaning that these tracks are much more recent than the specimens that we've uncovered. But so far, there have been no other theropod fossils found nearby to rule Smok out. And another piece of evidence that it could have possibly been a dinosaur came from the partial skull, which had enough of it preserved to successfully cast a brain case. And it shows that the brain of this animal was more complex than the more simple brains of, say, Rawasukids like Postasukas. In fact, it has been noted that this animal seems to have had a brain that was very similarly shaped to Allosaurus, one of the most well-known carnivorous dinosaurs from the Jurassic. So perhaps maybe the answer is in the hip bones. Since this is the first thing that scientists look to in order to figure out how to classify Triassic archosaurs under the heading of Dinosaur, Rawasukid, or Prestosuchid, because this is when those differences first really started to appear. But unfortunately, this does not help at all, because the hip and leg bones of Smok literally look like a cross between the two basic configurations. The groove on the ilium where the femur attaches is similar to a theropod, but there's also a ridge on it that we normally only see in Rawasukids. And then if we look at the jaws, we see a setup that actually doesn't even match with either group. The premaxilla and the maxilla of the upper jaw attach closely to each other, making a continuous row of evenly spaced teeth. 
And in both dinosaurs and land crocs, there's a gap in the teeth where the maxilla and the premaxilla attach. And I'm still not even done. There are even features in the hips and skull that seem to match with earlier archosaurs. This is the kind of thing that gives paleontologists a headache. But regardless of where exactly this animal fits into the archosaur family tree, there's no question what niche this thing was filling in late Triassic Europe. Since smock has only been found in rock layers that have been dated to the very end of the Triassic, that means that it lived in a land that was being ripped apart. Pangaea was beginning to crack, and actually one of the first separations were between Europe and North America. And these new seaways flooding in that would eventually become the Atlantic meant that life was probably very different for the animals here than it had been previously. You see, one of the drawbacks that come from a massive supercontinent is that moisture has a much harder time traveling inland. That means in a world where there is only one giant continent, that continent is probably going to be largely covered in desert. But now that Pangaea was showing cracks in its armor, that could change. This area was probably quickly becoming a much more tropical landscape, but still being racked by earthquakes and possible volcanic eruptions. In order to survive in this environment, the animals that would do the best would be the ones that could be adaptive. And this strange hodgepodge of a reptile was exactly that animal. At an estimated 5 to 6 meters long, this was the largest carnivore in the ecosystem. It is believed to have hunted the large herbivorous Dicynodonts, descendants of earlier members like Bulbasaurus. But these guys had become the largest members of this group to ever exist. The enormous six-ton Lysowikia, named after the Polis village where both it and Smok were found. And although Smok was very likely a hunter of these behemoths, there would be evidence to support that this hunter had a much more varied diet coming in the form of coprolites, or fossilized feces. These coprolites would be found to contain lots of bone fragments from everything from dicynodonts, to amphibious timnospondyls, to even fish along with the broken remains of smoke teeth. This implies that Smoke may have been a bone crusher, who was a highly adaptive predator that adjusted its feeding habits to whatever prey was available. And since this animal was also eating bones, it can also be theorized that it may have been supplementing its diet with bone marrow, the high-fat substance inside bones. This is a behavior that many different mammal groups exhibit, but we don't normally see this kind of complex survival strategy in reptiles. So this appears to have been the perfect animal to survive the changing world that it was inhabiting. Long after the giant land crocs like Fasolasuchus had died out, this animal became the apex predator. And it was managing to survive in a world that was in the process of going through another mass extinction. And it seems to have had the tools to actually make it through. So in the end, what happened to this mysterious dragon from the twilight of the Triassic? In the end, the fate of the mighty Smok is yet another thing that we don't fully understand. Going into the Jurassic period, much of Europe would become inundated with a shallow sea that would only leave small islands across the region. And by this time, the Dicynodonts were gone. And because we don't exactly know where Smok fits, it's hard to say if it went extinct at the end of the Triassic or not. If it was a species of land croc like Archosaur, its time probably ran out around 200 million years ago, since all later land crocs bear very little resemblance to it. But, if it is indeed an early species of theropod, then it is much more likely to have been one of the forebearers of the largest terrestrial carnivores to ever exist. But, until more fossil evidence is found to solidify its place in the Tree of Life, this will remain a mystery. As a final thought though, I would like to go back to those three-toed footprints found above the layer where Smok was first found in Poland. Because Smok's layer is dated to so late in the Triassic, these footprints being a full meter higher means that whatever left them behind did so in the Jurassic period. So if these do get confirmed to be the footprints of Smok, that would mean that this trackway proves that this animal survived the Triassic extinction and into the age of truly giant dinosaurs, and during this time continued to be a top predator of this changing world. 
I want to thank my patrons for suggesting this fascinating topic for a video. These are the kind of things that I love covering because we don't actually know a ton about them. And I really enjoy the speculation that presenting creatures like this can invoke. If you want to join the team of people who get to pick the first video every month, I'll leave a link in the description for you to check it out. And now it's time for me to get to work on the rest of the projects I have lined up for this month. If you haven't heard yet, I will be once again joining Edge as well as many other Paleo creators on the yearly collaborative project Paleo Rewind. So look forward to that. I'll be covering November. It shouldn't be all that bad. Maybe I'll do a top five or something. Ah, uh, Steve? There was like seven new species described in November. Not to mention a bunch of other stuff. Wait, what? <laughs>